from Batman's complete dismissal of Kyle Rayner's assault to more or less every aspect of Peter Parker's life and even Nightcrawler's revamped origins. Hey, that was Chris Claremont's original idea. Yes, and it's stupid. We have covered many messed up moments in comics that have made us go, Hey yo, what the f now I wanted to do something a little different. So we're gonna be covering every issue of Marvel Comics Ultimatum in this five part series. Each issue is going to be getting its own dedicated video. And when the series is completely wrapped, we can unpack another story arc filled with disgusting, vile, and downright messed up moments. Subscribe to become one of the over 70,000 people who get to say, what the f to these comic book moments. With all that said, let's get into the beginning of what I can only describe as the edgiest comic book universe the early 2000s had to offer. Our story starts at the Baxter Building, home of the Fantastic Four. However, since this takes place in the Ultimate Universe, things are a little different. For instance, instead of dealing with a group of older, more mature adults, we apparently are dealing with teenagers? What? What the fuck? Oh, okay, looks like we aren't really going to address that. All right, I'm going to have a lot of questions here, but I guess we're moving on. Reed Richards and Sue Storm are pictured talking to each other, and it looks like Reed is about to propose to Sue. And by what we see in this single panel, it doesn't really look like she's going to be into it. Ben Grimm, the thing, is busy working out and benching what he describes as a couple of tons with absolute ease. And of course, the final member of the Fantastic Four, Johnny Storm, who's pictured in the midst of an argument with his father, who's telling him to get up and make something of his life. He then begins to compare Johnny to his older sister before the Human Torch interjects and tells him to stop making it an unfair comparison. And it's at this point I want to go back to that opening line, that they're all still teenagers. And Franklin Richards saying, at your age, your sister Susan was already, and I have no idea, I'm just assuming doing some crazy That's an absolutely ridiculous comparison, considering Johnny, who admittedly is younger than Sue, has already been a superhero for, what, at least a year and change? We then see Tony Stark's mansion, where this universe's mightiest heroes, the Ultimates, reside. And in typical Tony Stark fashion, Tony is his usual rampant alcoholic self. And Captain America thinks they shouldn't be wasting their time and go out on patrol stopping crimes before another calamity hits New York. And Tony, being the complete tool that he is, responds with, you need to loosen up and have a drink and stop thinking about another man's wife. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Thor and Valkyrie are shown training, and Thor even quips that her skills with the sword have improved tenfold. And she responds with, You should see me in bed, Thor. Yeah, alright, that's enough of that. We even get to catch up with Ant-Man, now going by Yellow Jacket and the Wasp, where the two of them are arguing on whether it's a good idea or not to actually continue to wear the Ultron-inspired suit after all the damage cause. And of course, Hank refuses to change because he respects the drip. That's when Hawkeye reminds us that it's near inconceivable that Janet is still speaking to Hank after he sprayed her with bug spray. What did he say? <laughs> yeah, that really happened and I've already covered it on this channel. Long story short, we learned that the Hank pimp slap is apparently a canon event and happens no matter what universe we're in. We see Peter Parker, the amazing Spider-Man, riding a train with some friends. Holy sh**. Is that Steve Harwell? Well, the years start coming and they don't stop. No! None of that! Shame on you! Also, it's nice to know that apparently in Marvel Comics, Batman exists as a fictional character. I'm sure that won't cause any problems or plot holes in other Marvel universes. Heck, we even get a good look at the X-Men walking down Broadway. When suddenly... Oh, well, it's just a bit of rain. That's actually not too bad. Oh my god! The city begins to flood as Reed tries to get to the top of the Baxter building. Meanwhile inside, the thing catches a whale that breaches through the wall, while Johnny and Franklin float through the newly flooded kitchen. Hank Pym expands and rips through Tony's mansion, desperately screaming for his wife, Janet Van Dyne. At this point, it's basically been about two straight minutes of flooding, and it looks like Bruce Banner, 
just, you know, kind of just floating through the world without any care, until he finally activates as the Hulk. We go back to Peter, now with Kitty Pride, who just phased through the roof of the subway. She gets him to snap back to his senses and tells him that people need his help, and that he has to go. And with that, Spider-Man is officially on the scene. And I gotta say, I kinda love this look for Spider-Man. I don't know about this, but I just have a good feeling that everything's gonna be finally turning out well for Spider-Man in this comic. We see many Marvel superheroes trying to save their friends. Iron Man was able to get Captain America out before it was too late, and Steve asks, who all made it out? Where are the rest of us? But Tony says he doesn't know. It all happened so fast. So many bodies. Hard to tell where anyone was. Anyone. Thinking quickly, Sue Storm was able to put up a barrier and stop more water from coming into New York. Before she basically immediately passes out. The thing finally makes it up to the roof, where he asks Reed, what the hell is going on? And it looks like Sue is barely breathing, clinging to life, and Reed knows she needs help. But Ben slaps him back down to reality. I mean, look around. The city is flooded. They're surrounded by death. Reed says he has to get to Johnny or Dr. Storm. But Ben fears they might have already lost both of them. So Reed ditches his best friend and his girlfriend to see what's going on and learn about what started all of this. Mr. Fantastic ends up confronting Namor and accuses him of being responsible for all this death and destruction. And Namor says, I could care less what you think. <coughs> Before ripping Reed through the windshield of his ship and claiming he had nothing to do with what happened to New York. Reed absolutely doesn't believe him and starts fighting back. But Namor says he wouldn't do this because of Sue Storm. And let's pause right there to say, yes, Sue Storm and Namor had a bit of a thing. I mean, technically it was under duress, but still makes it double personal for Reed to get revenge. So Reed knocks him the f*** out. And then, after the fact, says, if it wasn't you, who and why? You know, for being the world's smartest man, he probably could have gotten a little more information before lashing out. But once again, Fantastic Four in this universe are apparently just teenagers. And good lord, how old was Namor when he and Sue Storm shared a little intimate moment? Hey, can somebody get Chris Hansen on the phone? At this point, it's been around 20 minutes since New York went underwater, and we can see that the effects are further reaching than we thought, as we see Doctor Doom in Latveria. But unlike New York, it seems like this small European country was hit with a near immediate catastrophic freeze. And as for the people inside Doom's castle, they are frozen completely solid in place. Statues in time. And after he busts through the door, we see it's not just the people inside his castle. In fact, it's his entire country. Now back at the X-Mansion, we get confirmation that Nightcrawler, Beast, and more are gone. According to Professor X, millions have just perished from this cataclysmic event. Professor X quickly tries to warn everyone he can that he knows what happened and not only how, but why. Professor X says he will not stop until it's worse, far worse. Professor X reveals that the person behind this evil plot has planned to wipe out the entire world. Charles never thought he would actually go through with it, and now it's revealed Magneto was behind everything. Even fully equipped with Thor's hammer, he even says, Yes, bring them, Charles. Bring everyone. So I can tell them myself for what they've done. They will have to pay the ultimate price. This closes out issue number one and the first part of our series. There are so many questions still left unanswered. Why would Magneto do this? He's taking out his fellow mutants in the process. Who all is left alive after the Cataclysm? And how exactly did he cause this worldwide pandemonium? Together we'll go a little bit deeper next week in part two. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like as it really does help. Subscribe for more. And if you'd like to support the channel, think about becoming a member. Go ahead and let me know any other stories or arcs that you'd like to see me cover in more messed up moments. And if it's a little bit more involved, we can do another series like this. So go ahead and comment down below. I hope you have a great day, and as always, I'll catch you in the next one.